Hey folks, welcome to Sifted Ideas. In this episode, we have a conversation with Mike Kemp. Mike is a local photographer who has been at it a good long while and just takes absolutely fantastic photos and is a good dude who's enjoyable to talk to also. But he's done some great work over the years for the University of Central Arkansas and 501 Life and maybe for you as well. He's taken a lot of photos for a lot of people. And we talk about his philosophy behind photography, what are the principles that are important to him as a photographer, as well as some of the more meaningful portraits that he's been there to capture over the years. And also a lot about Iceland, strangely enough. But uh, it was a really enjoyable conversation, and I hope you like it. I've been looking at lots of your pictures. Oh, really? Yes. Where at? All over, wherever I found them on the internet. Good. Well, I see cool. there's an Iceland pick on the wall behind you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, one, of, one the four. of my favorites. I'm sorry? That's one of the four that made the exhibition, yes? I can't remember. I, I know that one did. I did have four favorites. I can't remember if I put those in the exhibition or not, but I do know I did that one. So it's, it's printed on a metal substrate rather than a traditional photographic paper because I wanted it. And I knew, you know, I had to come up with all these prints and there's a a bit of a financial investment in that. And these are, they're not cheap, but they're beautiful when they're printed right. I figured that when I wanted a big print just for myself anyway, because that, that one in particular, I remember taking it and, and just know it's one of those moments where you have something that's in your head that you actually see translated into the, the finished product. I knew when I shot it, I wanted to do it in black and white. I you know, obviously shot it in color, but it was a black sand beach and, and the, the rock was black and the tide just rolled in and, and then rolled back out. It, it just all, I hate to say it all clicked because that's a horrible pun, but hey, I'll be here all week. It, it all fell together and, and it, it looked exactly like I saw it in my head. Well, the finished product did. The, the raw file needed a little polishing. Of all the things to capture that kind of summed up the feeling of that whole trip, was, which was just incredible, that one did it for me. That's, that's kind of a long-winded explanation that you really didn't ask for, but I love that photo. I would highly recommend anyone making a trip to Iceland because it's just a, a weirdly beautiful country. Oddly enough, reminded me of Hawaii because of the volcanic nature of how the island was formed uh, it just wasn't as lush so you can see these mountains just popping up and think well that's kind of like hawaii only not as warm and lush and lots more sheep yeah that trip and it, and it was really fun it, kind of in time tying in with you know being a photographer i've had a lot of times where you know, and traveling Arkansas, Arkansas is beautiful. Well, the United States is beautiful and there's a variety there, but there's also a familiarity with it and, and going to a totally different landscape was a lot of fun as a photographer. I mean, I felt like I walked away with some things that were really neat and wasn't really even going necessarily as a photographer. I didn't have my my photographer hat on. I had my tourist hat on, you know, but to be inspired by something like that. Fun thing about that too was the uh, restrictions that were kind of put on us in traveling. We were on a budget airline, a wow airlines, which has now gone under. It, it was incredibly cheap, but because of that, it being a budget airline, you get charged for snacks or checking a bag or there were a lot of extra charges. You were allowed, I think, one carry-on. And so we decided, you know, a carry-on and a backpack. And that's what we were going to live out of. And he had a big duffel bag. So that was our carry-on. And we had to really kind of pare down the amount of gear that I took. So I ended up taking a micro four thirds camera, which is a much smaller camera for well, in fact, it's at it right here. This cool little Panasonic micro four thirds. This may have been the lens I took that photo with. And the lenses are so small, I could stuff them in a pocket. But it was kind of fun to put some restrictions on 
the amount of stuff that we took. So I couldn't take a, a huge DSLR and, you know, 40 pounds worth of gear and backup bodies. I had one camera. The first day I bought this cheap uh, USB charger to charge the batteries because we felt like outlets would be at a premium. The first day it broke. On, on that first day, the first night, I walked out of our hotel and, and one of my goals was to photograph the Northern Lights, the Aurora. David, my cousin had actually gone a year prior and that was one of the things they wanted to see. And he said they got there and were just exhausted. So they went to the hotel and crashed. And that night it was clear. Every other night it was cloudy. So this time we were stopped at a little town on the coast and I walked out to the car for something. And I looked up and saw this cloud-like thing moving. And I said, Dave, let's, this could be it. Let's go down to the beach. And I took a shot and just, holy cow, the green lit up. And I'm, I'm jumping up and down all excited. So just restricting what we had to take kind of opened up some different levels of creativity in how we did things. So my background when I first started was photojournalism. And by the nature of that, you couldn't really carry a lot of of gear because it would slow you down. Um, A lot of the things that you were doing were kind of fluid in nature. So things were happening and you had to be ready. You might have a little bit of control, but you've got a CEO who needs a portrait and five minutes in a conference room that, you know, is a a fluorescent hell, but you still have to make something happen. So that's been kind of the fun part of how I I tend to approach things is that I'm not an organized person to begin with, admittedly. And I don't do well in planning things, but I do feel like I'm fairly competent in walking into a situation and quickly assessing it and being able to get a vision in my head of how things should turn out. And uh, sometimes it works really well. Sometimes I'm pleasantly surprised and (laughs) sometimes I'm sweating bullets, but you know, it all seems to work out. And I've had a lot of times where I would come back from an assignment, particularly in my film days, and, and yes, I am that old, where I would get the film out of the processor and, and you know be looking through it and just think, ah, oh, this is, I've got nothing. This is all crap. And walk away and come back and go, okay, there's, there's one frame out of this 36 exposure world that's, that's okay. And, and then maybe, you know, go through it again and go, well, okay, these are, are usable. And just o- being able to overcome that fear or being that much of a self-critic to find the stuff that actually is not as bad as you had envisioned. And particularly in situations like that, where everything that you had planned changes and to be able to come back and have something that builds onto your confidence for the next time around where something, you know, the building's on fire. <laughs> We'll do it. You know, we we can do this. I've done this before. You hit on something that is the whole reason why we wanted to do this podcast. We want to just talk to creative people about their processes and what makes them tick because there are so many principles that are portable no matter what discipline or context you're in. There have been so many times that the stuff that I'm interested in that is tangential, if I can use a nerdy word, that, that doesn't directly have bearing in what I'm working on will suddenly inform something about what I'm doing. I mean, you're, you're a musician as well. How many times <laughs> has... Well, that's putting it. That's, that's being awfully charitable with that. Uh, <laughs> there are guitars in your office. I see them. There are guitars. I, I do play them occasionally. <laughs> has it happened to you? Because it has to me, where a principle or something about the discipline of being a musician has informed some other creative endeavor that you've been a part of. It's interesting in walking the dog today and thinking about doing this podcast and one of the things that just kind of popped into my head is you know how little even through the downtime i haven't really played my guitar i mean Mm -hmm. i I picked it up and i noodle around and go that doesn't sound so bad and then i set it down or i try something and go well that didn't work and, and walk away and was thinking back at times when maybe i was taking lessons or participating in a church band or something that forced me into having to practice, having to go through and just play scales or or do something like that. And having long stretches away from doing what I do, and I've done photography for a long time, but even in the slow times, walking away and coming back and thinking, do I still remember how to do this? And having, you know, some fear of, holy cow, you know, what if people don't start calling me back? And, you know, how's this all going to play out? Just that discipline of doing something all the time. And and I'm not the greatest at doing that. And I guess I'm fortunate that I'm lucky enough that it does come back quickly. And and I know I can remember enough or have done it long enough that 
yeah, once I get the camera in my hand, it may not be perfect, but things start falling into place and, and working out okay. There's a lot of truth to the discipline of, of doing something all the time and, and how that can help in terms of consistency and, and improvement. This podcast, for example, part of the reason why I'm jumping in this is because there isn't as much of the other kind of work to do. I still have things that I'm working on, but doing this kind of work helps me to practice being organized. It helps me to practice the thing we do, which is to distill from the, the most information down to what's essential and important, both in doing my research for a conversation, preparing for it, and then after the fact, going back through and picking out the things that, okay, I think these are what are relevant. That's what we do when we make videos or do websites or any, any, anything that we do. We're sifting, ah, see what I did there. We're, yeah. we're sifting down from the widest possible range of ideas into the things that we find most essential. So I'm going to be better at everything that I do in theory going through a process like this. And, and then hopefully, you know, it's, it's a thing I haven't done before. You know, I've, I've done interviews, I've done lots of conversations like this, sure. but as far as curating them to then present to somebody later in this way, I've never done that. And right. it, it was time. <laughs> you know, yeah. why not? It's not a pursuit that I've considered and not to knock it by any means. Um, my wife loves podcasts and I, I've had trouble focusing on them, even when it's something I'm really interested in. I don't know if my mind just shiny objects distract me or whatever. So <laughs> I knew going into it that, you know, if, if talking to someone is not a problem, you know, right. I could talk to you all day and until you really get tired of me. <laughs> But kind of by the same token, in the crossover there, I'm a little bit fascinated by video, the similarities and the differences to still photography. Sure. Partly because I have one particular client who has hired me to do some videos, and most of them have been in terms of production, I mean, a lot of one-on-one -on -one interview type things, which if you can frame a shot and light a shot, you know, you, you don't have to get into the technical minutia of video as long as you know mm -hmm. you're exposing well and, and your right. frame rates are all matching up and all that but as you also know i love to ride motorcycles and one of the things I've d i did recently and want to pursue more of it and that's been kind of my outlet through the pandemic is to go for a ride somewhere but i got my gopro out and put it on the on my helmet and just video myself riding came back put it into pr premiere and started chopping and adding music and and stepping back and going Wow, that's crap. But <laughs> <laughs> and it really, I mean, that's probably being too harsh on myself. But the reason I say that too is like, well, it's just one angle. So what if I had added a different angle? What if I had done a more interesting road or, you know, I learned a couple of editing things that yeah. I've probably forgotten because it's been a couple of days since I've walked away from it. But I really didn't approach it as I've got to have something that's either marketable or somebody's going to want to purchase. Mm -hmm. it, it was just me going out. I was, I was going out for a ride anyway. So why, why not try this and see if I can learn something from it that could make me marketable or could be a creative itch to scratch at some point. You know? Yes. And I, I think it's important for creative people of whatever kind. And I think you find creativity everywhere. It's not just for the folks who make videos or art or are photographers or actors or whatever. Those are not the only ones who are creating people. You can be creative in how you run your business or how you, how you clean the floor in the room that you're responsible for. Because <laughs> creativity is just problem solving. You, you're, you're looking at the raw material of the world around you and you're deciding what's important about it and then trying to figure out how to present that to somebody in a way that's compelling so that they will respond to it. That kind of curiosity, I think, is essential for people who are going to create things. And you can't think about while you're doing it, is this going to be marketable? Is this who, who's going right. to care about this? For me, it, it's all about focusing on the process and focusing on is this accomplishing what the sound I hear on my head, the picture I hear in the head, in my head, the video I want to see, whatever it is. And I find that leading with your curiosity, even if you're creating something for a client, is how you do good work. And that I, a lot of the stuff I've seen or heard from people that maybe is not as good, I wonder if it's not that, well, they're aware of what formula that they're trying to hit. Right. And they're aware of what their audience wants. And that's as far as they're going with it. 
I think that's a very good point too. And going back to the point I made earlier about changing your environment, I think some of the things that I've been most satisfied with in terms of what pleased me photographically were times where I went someplace completely different that I'd never been and Mm -hmm. just looking around and and being curious. And even, you know, trying to cross discipline, I, I have been blogging recently about my journey to find my birth parents which I did last year and just wanted to do it as something for myself or or for my kids to look back on and have some point of reference to know how things unfolded, even though they were here. uh, You know, I just wanted to, at some point when I can't remember, there is a document somewhere that, that does. And, And it's one of those endeavors that I've done for myself. And that's something I truly don't do enough of is something that I'm curious about and going out and, and chasing that a little bit. I really enjoyed your blog. Oh, thank you. In preparing for this conversation, uh, I went, you know, everywhere where your work is present that I could find it, basically, and looked at the photos that were there and then read a lot of the posts. And we'll we'll return to it in a minute, but I I was going to bring that up. I'm glad you read it. I I wasn't sure that. And that's another thing. When I put it out there, I thought, "Eh, nobody's going to read it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, which is fine. I didn't put it out there for necessarily people to flock to. And then I started getting these Facebook messages. And it's like, when's the next one coming? Yeah. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Whenever I find time or the words. And, and I was a little fascinated that people actually did read it. You know, I was quite moved by one post you had, I think from 2016, called Learning to Fly. Ah, yeah. It was your it was your one year anniversary post, and because I can, my one year was um, a couple of months back. First of April of this year was my one year since we started. Really, so, yeah. April Fool's Day. Yes, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why we picked that? There were some things that you had in that post. You talked about having to eat what you kill, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Which is a term that a friend of mine who was doing the same thing said to me, uh, and I'd never heard that phrase, but I felt like it was very, very applicable to, yeah. you know, launching your own whatever. And the, there was one line in there, and I, uh, I actually choked up at reading it because it read it, it resonated so strongly with me when you were finishing the post off and and kind of summarizing your thoughts and putting a bow on it, as they say. You said to to all the people the individuals whose portraits or family photos that I done that I've done, I hope I've made you proud. And I was just like, Oh man, that, that really resonated with me because ultimately that's what we're trying to do for people. We're trying to present them with something that reflects at the deepest level who they are and makes them feel like, yes, that's me. And I want to, this is a tool I want to use to introduce people to me, whether it's a video that we make for a business or a website we build for somebody, or even, a social media campaign. We want it to foster real relationships in the real world. And if it's not doing that, then we haven't done our job. But I found that very profound. That's very cool. I never considered myself to be profound. So, Well, you weren't trying to be. You were just being honest about what, what it meant to you. Yeah. And, and I, I feel like that's the best approach and who I try to be is, you know, if, if nothing else, honest. And, and when I write things, that's, that's kind of what I, I like to try to put out. A lot of photographers put out these blog posts and, and I, I would almost use air quotes that are tons of images from a shoot and lots of exclamation marks and hashtags. And, and that's fine. If that's what they want or need to do. To, to get their message out, and then so be it. That's that's great. But I didn't really want to do that because I didn't feel like that's who I am. So I really tried to go in a different direction and, and post about things that, that were important to me and were in, in my voice and weren't just shameless self-promotion. I feel like I'm a terrible salesman. I relate strongly to that. Although that is a little bit of you know what we do. There is an element of that, but it's been kind of fun to be a little thartic with, with that type of stuff too. Well, and what we would say about it in kind of in the circles we run in is what that does is it adds perceived value to your work. It adds richness and context to it because you are letting people see the brain that is behind the hands that are going to capture their images. And for you, it's not like this is not Instagram fodder for me. This is 
a deeply personal comes out of a deeply personal desire to represent you as you truly are or right. to represent the things about you that you think are important. That ties into something that you said about photography generally, that being a witness is one of the greatest things about photography in that you get to be present for people's sacred moments. And yeah. as you put it, it's it, it, it sometimes is a golden ticket into situations that most people don't get to see from right next to it. Can you talk a little bit about that concept and what that has looked like for you as a photographer? It's interesting. As a photojournalist, you know, you get into places a lot of times that other people wouldn't have access to, good and bad. The bad thing about being, when I, when I was doing photojournalism, was that most of the things that I would be getting that ticket into were, were not the best days for, for the people involved. Flip side of that, you know, being able to, one, one in particular, and, and I don't do this very often, but somebody asked me to photograph her revealing to her husband that they were pregnant. It was, it was a total surprise to him. You know, he, he was busy. And it was one of those, it's like, why is he here? You know, what, whatever. But to see, to be there for that moment when my wife and I found out we were pregnant, you know, it was a very personal thing. But to have somebody invite you in and have the confidence in you to capture that moment. I've done engagements that way. I don't do weddings anymore, but to be trusted to do something that's that monumental and personal, it's, it's important. And I feel like it speaks to the value of photography, too, that, you know, years from now, well, I guess if your house caught on fire, what's the first thing you want to grab? You know, the television? Or <laughs> <No>. <laughs> the photo albums? The guitars, you know? of course. <laughs> well, of course. Well, yes, the guitars. And then the photo albums. You know, I had a friend who's got whose Facebook account somehow got deactivated or deleted, and she really the things she lamented miss you know not having were all the photos she had taken and put on Facebook, and I guess not backed up in a different location. So I really think that speaks to what we do, the importance of what we do, and and the fact that oftentimes being invited into and trusted to capture those moments, you know, is, is sacred. In a lot of ways. What are some of the the moments that stick out in your mind as as these are? I mean, you mentioned one just now, but what are some others that you look back and say that that really meant something to me? That was a real honor to be there to capture that. Wow, I've done it for so long. There, are, there are so many first looks. I, I remember doing a first look for a wedding. It actually wasn't too long ago, and I've been kind of been out of the game a little bit. This was somebody who had taken a photography class and had hired another photographer to photograph the wedding in like six weeks prior to the wedding or maybe sooner than that. The photographer just flaked out, couldn't do it. And I just thought I couldn't bear the thought of somebody not having that. And I'm still just, if you want to get me to shoot your wedding, you know, hire another photographer and then have them leave. <laughs> um so she, she did a first look, which I, like I said, I hadn't done enough weddings that I wasn't super familiar with it, you know, but it was with her dad. I thought they normally did them with the groom, but not the dad. And he was this big, tough, burly guy who just sobbed when he <laughs> saw her. And that was, yeah. I'm choking up a little bit just talking about it. You know, that moment to capture that raw emotion, other times have been, you know, not as nice, but witnessing you know, tragedies and being there to, to record it, which oftentimes people don't want you there, but sometimes they want that record to, to let people know that this just isn't a number. It's a brother, sister, parent. There are so, so many things swirling around that I can't pinpoint, you know, one or two. Certainly the birth of my children recording those, that was just amazing. And I, I'm, I'm constantly amazed at people that photograph births to be able to witness that and hope that that doesn't become trite or unimportant, the, the gravity of that situation. So I think it's cool that there are so many that you're having trouble whittling it down. That speaks of a lot of years doing what you do in such a way that you have so many of those moments. It's great to have that in, in, in your backlog, I would think. It, you know, it's really funny. I had to go to the doctor once and a nurse came in and was checking me out. She said, oh, you photographed my wedding. <laughs> and I went, I did? 
And I couldn't remember it. You know, it's one of those things that I've done so much for a guy who doesn't do weddings. I'm sure talking a lot about weddings. My wife has that same thing, except it's, you delivered my children. <laughs> <laughs> I had a doctor the other day that, speaking to how old I am, was doing headshots for the hospital and he walked by and I said, hey, are you needing a headshot? He's like, no, 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 I'm good. And then he took a couple steps. He turned around and looked at me and said, you took my picture when I was five years old. Wow. And starts telling me, you know, from the newspaper, he was out playing with a water hose in the neighborhood. And he's a doctor now. And I'm like, and my response to him was, that doesn't make me feel old at all. But that he would remember that moment. Yeah. Which I would have been working for the newspaper. So it's one of those things, you know, driving around looking for something to fill a hole on the front page or, or somewhere, you know. In that same post, which is called Learning to Fly, you remarked in that same kind of couple ending paragraphs about giving people artifacts that they can carry with them through their lives. That's what you did for that guy. Yeah. I was introduced to a college class once that I was speaking to. And as a photojournalist, you, you, you feel like you got to climb the ladder and win awards and whatever. And he talked about, he introduced me. I, can't, I wish I could remember the guy's name, but he said, you know, a lot of photographers place great importance in winning awards and accolades, but this man has pictures on refrigerators everywhere, which is probably a bigger accolade. And I was like, holy cow. He even made me stop and kind of think, I'm approaching this all wrong. You know, it's not about what's on my mantle. It's what's on somebody else's refrigerator or scrapbook or whatever. And it really shaped my worldview about, you know, what I do. Don't ever think that something's beneath you. Somebody's might find a great value or great bit of importance in that. It, it's sort of like for us, we work almost exclusively with small business or even if it's a larger one, it's, you know, locally franchised or what have you. A good communication strategy can be the difference between that business being open next year or not. So on the one hand, how much weight does a Facebook post or a page of a website carry ultimately? Well, maybe not that much, but if it contributes to those people that you're working with, that you're trying to represent accurately, you know, through your visuals and your writing or whatever, if that translates to they get to have another five years of doing what they love to do or whatever those hallmarks of success are for them, well, then you've done your job. Who cares if anybody noticed? They certainly did. And that was the whole point of it anyway. And not really something you think about. You're just doing your job, but you doing your job well could mean that they have a longer lifespan as a business. So. A moment ago, you kind of touched on this, and this is another thing from one of your blog posts, that you view it as a, you're collaborating with your subjects to help present themselves to the world. And I don't think a lot of people would necessarily think of photography as collaborative. That, that struck me. Other than, yeah. hey, you go stand over there, smile. But in a way, it's almost like a director coaxing a performance out of an actor, I would think, in that. Can, can you create an environment for them to be themselves so you can capture it? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it's very much that way. It's interesting that you, you said that. You know, a lot of times I feel like I'm trying to tell a story about who they are, and it may not be, you know, an epic, but people have a certain image of themselves that I'm sure they want portrayed. I really kind of need to read that. And particularly if it's on a commercial job, you know, I think it's important to know you know, the messaging that they're trying to present. And it is interesting because it is very collaborative in that circumstance where you have an art director, you know, maybe working with a video crew and you're all trying to sync up and, and make similar imagery. But even in a portrait one-on-one, -on -one, you know, if I'm taking a portrait of a banker, they don't want to look like a clown. There's a certain air of respectability and knowledge and trust that you want to come across in that portrait. And so I do feel like it's very collaborative, but at the same time, people do look to you as the expert. And so, you know, <laughs> the, the question I get all the time, what do I do with my hands? Because it's not something you ever think about, really. No, it's like, not. Or at least most and people don't. And it's very interesting how people get in front of a camera. And it is intimidating. I mean, when I take self-portraits, I it's at least an exercise in empathy for the people I'm having to photograph. But I do try to, you know, talk them through the process. I, I can talk. I've heard it. Yes. <laughs> you, you have. You have evidence of it here. But just to be able to sit down with them, and if nothing else, the collaboration is to make them feel more at ease. If they can come across, if I can break through that wall and, and 
help them tell the story. I did some work for the Cartai Foundation a few years ago, and it, it was really neat because a lot of it was focused on survivors of cancer. And some of it wasn't pleasant. You know, some of them, you know, we had some assignments that we needed to do quickly because it's possible they didn't have a lot of time left. Yeah, and trying to show the strength and the dignity. And I, I remember photographing one woman in particular and it was a small apartment and just kind of had to make do with what I had. One of those situations, the uh, person that hired me just loved the images. He felt like it showed so much dignity and strength. And he said, you know, it's like a National Geographic portrait of someone, which made me feel really good. I felt like that was high praise, but also that I portrayed her in a way that, you know, showed the story and, and you know, showed how hard she was fighting and, and struggling against this terrible disease. There's one particular photo that you've done, probably which has made the rounds more than any others, and that's the one that you titled Honor. I'll put a link to it in the show notes, but it's an older gentleman in his military attire, and there's an American flag in the background. It's black and white, and this you can see the story in it. At least I, I yeah. feel like I can because you know the years are lived mm -hmm. there. You can see the sorrow there. At least I can, but at the same time the strength and the, the sparkle of joy behind it. So can you talk a little bit about what it was like to, to capture that image? The front end of it was a bit of a struggle. So that was for a local magazine here, 501 Life. The theme was veterans. And we'd kind of gone back and forth about what we wanted on the cover. I love black and white imagery. There's something about it that's timeless and, and very powerful. I think for me, it's because it's a, it's a perspective you don't usually have. In right. that yeah. you're normally you might be paying attention to, oh, that shirt is really bright or whatever it is. But that yeah. that kind of inf info sensory input is taken out of it and you just have to focus on the lines. Anyway, sorry. Continue. And very much our 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 sensory inputs are, are geared toward color. You know, mm -hmm. we're attracted to bright, vibrant colors. But I had kind of had a vision in my head of how I wanted to photograph an older soldier in, in uniform. And we had this this gentleman who was 94, had served in World War II. And we talked about photographing him in front of, it was between him and a flag at one of the banks. And, a, and a, the flag is huge. But when you photograph a flag against the sky, it doesn't matter. You know, it's still, it's not going to be, the, the size, you lose a good bit of that. So you, unless you have something to give it some proportion, it's just hard to fathom. So we kind of went back and forth. And I, I jokingly, you know, said about it, Let's, let's put him in front of the flag at this bank. And, and the publisher was like, that's a wonderful idea. And I was like, oh, no, I've, I've, now I've done it. <laughs> so in talking to him, again, he was 94 and, and his wife kind of ran as the middleman. And she, she talked about, you know, he just, he, 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 was, he was fairly frail. And she didn't think without assistance that she could get him to the bank and, you know, it started to be this kind of ordeal. And I said, let's just do it at home. Do you have a flag? She said, yes. And so I said, look, I'll make it work. I'll, I'll make it happen. And of course, I get there that day and arrive and, you know, start kind of setting up. She said, well, give us a few minutes and let me get him out. And he was uh, on a walker and, and moving very slowly. In fact, it was really kind of, it affirmed that if we had done it at the bank, it would have been terrible for him. I mean, it would have been very hard. But, you know, he came out and was very congenial, very talkative and, and, and very sharp. You know, just we had a nice little conversation. And unfortunately, the walker had a chair and I said, you know, well, let's just have him sit. And his wife was kind of insistent that he stand. And I was like, no, no, it's really I don't want to make him do that. He's it's tough. And it, kind of my the thing I like to do is, is a little bit of dramatic lighting. So I did set up two different lights, uh, one on him, even though it's outside, it's in the shade. So I can use the light to create some contrast and shadows and make it a little more dramatic. And I also put a light pointed at the flag and then put a what's called a grid on it that restricts the light to a particular area. And took a couple shots of him I'm looking at me, you know, but I said, I really had it in my head. I wanted him looking off camera that, you know, maybe thinking about, you know, or at least showing what the experience must have been like. And in, in the course of conversation, he he's, I remember him telling me, you know, I can remember hearing the sound of that Japanese bullet whizzing through my Jeep. 
he said, if it had been a few inches, you know, and I'm just like, holy cow, I've never had an experience that I could say. I remember the sound of the bullet whizzing through. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a life experience that not many of us are going to have. So I really wanted to kind of show that the experience and, and life lived through all of that. And I you know, previewed the shot as I was taking it and I felt like I, I had it. So we, we took several and, and really the actual taking of the photo was probably 10 minutes at tops. And, and then I helped him he and his wife, you know, get back in the house and make sure they were, you know, kind of settled in and then went on my way and got home and just, you know, saw it and was like, oh, wow, this is, I, I like this. I hope they like it um, and, and showed it to them. And of course, they were like, yes, this is our cover. They did pick a different, a slightly different version than the, the one that I have displayed. Somewhat similar. I think he's looking in a little bit different direction, but still very similar everywhere else in regard of how it's set up and, and, and shot. It's happened to me a few times that you get out of this, the situation where you're capturing the thing or trying to, and then you get back to your own space and you review what you've done. And you described it earlier. Sometimes you're like, ah, none, this is okay, but well, I mean, I'll, I'll make it work and you have to come around to it. Yeah. But there've been a few times that I've, I've brought it up and it's been like, oh, Yep. <laughs> that was, yeah. we got it. Yeah. That, that was what yeah. we wanted to do. And that's, yeah. that's such a good feeling. And that's what moments like that keep me motivated to keep trying to get to that next moment, because to be creative is to be able to see the world in a way that it may not necessarily be in reality or right. to bring out something about it that you might not pay attention to the first go by. And right. to have a moment where you feel like I saw the opportunity and I was able to get it like that's it's such a shot in the arm, <laughs> you know, right. it's, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. Well, and even walking into that, not knowing, I mean, we knew we wanted the soldier, his uniform and a flag. And you can kind of do a mental sketch of what that might look like. But until you arrive and find out that he's not really mobile can't stand well could but i felt would feel bad about you know making him stand for any length of time you know which and even i use the lens that i don't typically use but i knew to get the elements where i wanted to just all of that going on within a space of a couple of minutes and then setting everything up and making it work and then to come back like you said and look at it and go, oh yeah that's exactly what i wanted even though the vision in my head looked totally different going in as it did leaving to get from point a to point b it's sometimes kind of a circular route we run into all the time particularly when we're doing film you plan because it gives you an outline and a framework it gives you an idea as to what problems you're going to have to solve but then you know going into it that probably a lot of that is not going to be super relevant, but the process of trying to solve the problems ahead of time is instructive. But you know that when you get there on the day that it's going to be different. That's a great way to put it too. And to allow yourself the grace and flexibility to take whatever does present itself and make it into something that may not look like the original product or image or whatever, but still comes out, you know, very pleasing is I think a big part of that as well. Somebody who was interested in photography or wanting to get into it and maybe didn't know where to start or didn't know what they should be thinking about. Do you have any anything that you found helpful or that you would want somebody to understand just starting out? A lot of it I feel like we've touched on, you know, find something that interests you and explore that and just play. You know, be be open to to playing or experimenting and you know seeing what works and what floats your boat. And being okay with failing. And that, that's, a, that's a tough one because I know in playing guitar, in taking photos or in doing whatever, I'm very much a person that if I get it on the first try, great. If I don't get it on that first try, I have a tendency to walk away and go, well, that didn't work. Rather than wrestling it and, and seeing where that messed up. I recently, a year or two years now, wanted to get my certified professional photographer designation through the Professional Photographers of America. 
And I had to take, you have to take a test which shows your technical knowledge. Um, and at the time, they've changed the testing up a little bit differently. You had to present images that were particular lighting patterns, short lighting, broad lighting with a two to one or three to one lighting ratio, I believe it was, which is stuff I've done for years. But having to sit down and do it, and I sent it to a, a photographer who uh, I took a class through actually to mm-hmm. prepare for this. And we'd show them to him and go, okay, what do I need to do here? And he would he would give me feedback. And it was not like, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But it was good constructive criticism. And, and some of it, I'm like, gosh, you know, I thought I did that. But we'd go back and try again. So finally, I put off submitting images for a year, partly because of the fear of failure. And until my wife, who's very good about doing this, just kind of said, do it. I mean, if you fail, you've got two or three other attempts to, to do it. But you got to do something. You can't sit here. So I did my first image submission, got my certification, <laughs> right, you know, and yeah, go figure. <laughs> but there's a lot of things that I think as creatives, we fear can really paralyze us. And I'm very much that that person. I, I feel like through all of this, I've not really taken advantage of downtime like I should and, and I think there's a lot of us in the same boat. We just don't, we, we're so uncertain about things. We don't know how to act. It's, I guess, a deer in a headlight kind of situation. But if you're starting out, just give yourself the grace to fail on, on whatever it is you're doing. But learn from that failure and do it better the next time. Make yeah. an improvement. We say a lot that a failure is only a waste if you don't learn from it. Right. When I first started shooting, we it was in the film days and we did black and white because it was cheaper and it was a good way to learn how to process film and, and it was more prevalent during that time. And so we had to learn to go in the dark room and roll the film on. And part of the problem, part of the thing you had to learn not to do was get the film stuck together because you would have big called chemical burned areas where that those images were gone. And You had to learn from that because if you're going to process your own film, you've got to know how to avoid that so that you don't lose your images. So definitely don't be afraid of failing. I've failed many times. It's not how often you fail. It's it's how often you get back up and, and go after it. That's good advice for somebody starting. (laughs) I think, Uh, I I mean, we, I'm sure there are other things we continue, could continue to talk about, but I think we have achieved a nice arc with this conversation. One thing I did want to ask, I know you're not primarily motivated by achievement or accomplishment per se, but are there places you want to go, photos that you want to take, images or subjects that you want to capture that you haven't been able to yet? I mean, there are plenty of places. I, I like to travel as well. I can't say there's one destination in particular. Well, no, I can't say. I would like to go to Ireland, Ireland, Scotland, whole UK, because I haven't been there. I have been to Italy and love going back there. People, that one's interesting because at one point in my career, I I love Amy Leibowitz's work and she deals with a lot of famous people. So at one point in my career would have been photographing musician or movie star or somebody who I've I liked. Now I'm much less motivated by that. I would like to find some more common people to document. I've really toyed with, and I actually have it right next to me, uh, an old studio camera. I'm a Mia RB67 loaded with black and white film that I did some portraits of my wife and daughters on Mother's Day. I'd like to explore using that because I miss shooting film. I, I feel like there is a real or perceived permanence to the images created with a film camera. There is a look that at one point, you know, being a a photographer who's who's transitioned from film to black to digital could say, well, you know, film has a look that you can't replicate with digital, which maybe, but if there is a difference now, it's it's much less prevalent or, or noticeable. You have the same conversation about recording that some guys swear by recording to tape versus digital well and even audio files who you know would rather buy vinyl than yeah a cd i get it you know but i sat through a workshop with a photographer from reno nevada who does black and white film portraits 
that I'm kind of fascinated by that. I mean, and, and literally he uses anything from medium format cameras to the view camera, which is the one that you always saw in like an old cartoons where the photographer gets, gets under the cover and, you know, prints it on um, a tin type or something. Yeah. 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 Oh, I'd love to do it 10 times. So that's and that. I, I can't say I'm old, but I'm not that old. So, <laughs> yeah. But to be to record more of that and do it more more for myself. One of the big regrets. I, I grew up in a small town um, in north central Arkansas, and it really isn't a town; it was a community. So calling it a town is being charitable. But we had a barber shop there, and the guy he was a fixture in the community. I always wanted to go back and just photograph him in his shop because it felt like the shop wasn't much bigger than this room, even though it really was. It was just a one room. And all the the older guys would come and just hang out. They would, you know, That's what some you do in a small hurt. town. Yeah. Exactly. You know, they talk about fishing and hunting, and you know, there's spots like if you go to um, if you go to Julie's Sweet Shop on a Friday morning, uh-huh. there's a table yeah. of them. Or if yeah. you go to, there's a lot of like out in the county or more rural areas. If you stop by a gas station that has like a restaurant or a little cafe in it, uh-huh. there'll be a table yeah. of those guys as well. Yeah. And I, I kind of want to photograph those guys, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. those are the people that I, I really want to seek out now, less of a, I guess, record of a famous person, but more so a, a, an image of somebody who portrays a concept, dignity, honor, you know, strength, that sort of thing. Because that's going to be a lot of people's grandpa. It's sort of like the honor image. Uh, like a lot of people have a grandfather who fought in World War II. My grandfather fought in World War II. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so did mine on my dad's side. And I could see a lot of people relating to the kind of guy that you're talking about. Saying yeah. like, there's somebody yeah. like that in my family, or I am that guy, or that's my dad, or that's my brother, yeah. or what have you. Yeah. I look forward to seeing those when you get them. Well, thanks for putting pressure on me to get it done. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be calling you every day for the next eight weeks. What have you done? What have you yes. done? Yes. <laughs> get out of the house. Get out of the house. Safely. Get out yeah. of the house. Yeah. Thank you so very much for sharing some of your time with us. I appreciate it. I have very much enjoyed the conversation. I think other people will too. And uh, if if they don't, then to heck with them. <laughs> I can listen to something else, by golly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, that is all for this episode. As I hope you could hear, I really enjoyed talking with Mike. And Mike, we really appreciate you sharing your perspective and your stories and your work with us. If you would like to see some of that work of Mike's that we were talking about, you can go to Mike Kemp, that's K-E-M-P, photo.com. And in the show notes, I will post some links to some of the specific photos and blog posts of his that we talked about in this episode. Also, if you want to follow Mike on Instagram, it's M Kemp Photo, and he posts images there regularly as well. Sifted is a creative agency that helps small businesses and nonprofits talk about who they are and what they do. We do that using websites and video and graphic design and social media and marketing and a whole bunch of other stuff. You can take a look at our work and reach out to us at wearesifted.com. And if you want to follow us on social media, we are at wearesifted. Thank you for listening.